Russ Barlow has been involved in, in scientific research on creation and Noah's flood for the last 20 years. As editor and author of the Universal Model, Science Project, and a dozen other science and church history books. Russ has a unique background and insight that he shares with members everywhere. Russ and his wife Heidi are the parents of 15 children and are currently residing in Las Vegas. Now, Russ will be speaking tonight on Adam and Eve in the Heartland and the Covenant with Enoch and Noah. His presentation will explore the science behind these great people and the events they presided over, including how they are particularly important to us in these Latin days. And for us, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Tonight we're going to talk about Adam and Eve in the Heartland. Probably not a new subject for you guys, but I might be able to share a couple of points that maybe you haven't thought of before. So first of all, let's talk about how we know this place exists and what it's about. So Joseph Smith receives a revelation in Doctrine and Covenants 107, and in this particular one, it's where he says that Adam, three years prior to his death, Adam gathers together his posterity to give them his last blessing. And it lists all of these men that we know are the patriarchs, Seth, Enos, Cain, Mahalo, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah. Methuselah is the grandfather of Noah. Noah's not there, and Noah's father, Lamech, is not there, because this is happening before those men are born. Now, Methuselah receives the priesthood from Adam, and then Methuselah gives the priesthood to Noah. So there's only a, there's one step between Adam and Noah. Okay, so in this place where they're gathering together, this place, Adam on Diamon, to give his last blessing. And then in DNC 116 is the revelation where Joseph says, that this is called Adam on Diamon because <laughs> this is where Michael or Adam, the ancient days, is going to come to visit the people at the end. These are the two bookings, the beginning and the end. And here we are standing in the place, kind of getting ready for that to happen. Okay, so we're going to jump into the subject now a little bit. Now, I want to ask this question to you. What do you believe that you know is not true? Yeah, it's kind of a trick question. Yeah, no, no, no. What do you believe that you know is not true? Hopefully nothing. Nothing, yeah. exactly. That would be the right answer because everything we believe is based on whatever has helped us in our lives, what we've gone through, our experiences. But here's kind of the trouble. If you and I believe something that's a little bit different, then that means one or both of us don't have the truth. We don't know. And so how do we learn these things? How do we open that door? All answers come from questions. You have to be willing to ask me to question things with an open mind and consider it. Now, there are different kinds of questions. And if we consider the difference between these two questions of knowledge versus wisdom, now there's lots of ways people can define the two. You can break them all into basically six different kinds of questions of who, what, where, when, why, and how. But in that, there are two groups. Questions of who, what, where, and when are knowledge questions. They're questions about physical, tangible things, like the place, or the person, or the time, or the, uh, the thing or event, right? The other two questions of how and why are intangible questions. Those are wisdom questions. Now, we often like, when something happens, we often like to say, why is this happening, Lord? We're seeking wisdom before we have knowledge. And there's a process, and we need to understand that. All right, let's jump back into the Garden of Eden. How many of you know where that is based on Revelation? Down the road. Okay, down the road. In that place, there were two trees. You know the names of those two trees? Tree of Life. Knowledge. Okay, so now isn't that interesting? We always add the clarifier, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And by saying of good and evil, it kind of deflects a little bit of our understanding. It's the tree of knowledge. Okay? So the tree of knowledge is the one that God knows these two people are going to partake of. And there's a reason that they need to partake of it. So the tree of knowledge is an important tree. And if we actually look at what Joseph received as a revelation in section 93, it said, truth is knowledge of things. Truth is knowledge of things. And what are those things? Who, what, 
where we went. Those are tangible things. Truth is knowledge of those things that doesn't change over time. Knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they will be. So it's change, it's, a, it's an unchangeable knowledge or physical, and those things give us understanding. So what was Satan's lie? What was his first? You know that? You'd be like a God, you'll have your eyes open. But in fact, his first lie is that he promised Eve she'd have wisdom before knowledge. He says, if you partake of this fruit, you will have wisdom. You will be wise. Okay, now this isn't the tree of wisdom. This is the tree of knowledge. And that the lie was, is that you would get this wisdom without knowledge. Now, in, in Moses chapter 1, which is a revelation that Joseph received when he was told to translate the Bible, we'll talk about it a little bit. One of the things that Moses is told, Moses says to the Lord, Lord, tell me how this happened, and I'll be content. And the Lord answers him and says, Here is wisdom, and it remaineth in me. So the question of how and why are wisdom questions, and the Lord says he's retained that, and it will be up to him to give us the wisdom after we put forth the effort to gain the knowledge. Where's another example in Scripture about this? When Nephi is told to build a boat that's not like any other boat that's been built, he doesn't say, how do I build it, Lord? What does he say? Where? Where do I get the oar? Where do I get the, the, like the tool? Things. That's right. He asks a knowledge question. Where do I go get the oar? And then it said the Lord gives him this other stuff as he needs it. He gives him the wisdom as he needs it. And we're going to talk about another one in just a second. But first, let's talk about the Bible that we have. Okay, now this is a, this is the standard Bible, King James. It's what we read every week. But we have this pesky little thing that sort of has developed a cultural, um, maybe this kind of rock or a stumbling stone. And it's Article of Faith number eight. What is that? That's part of this frame. Yeah, so dang that Bible, it's, we believe it as long as it's translated correctly. Ergo, <laughs> it's got problems, so we don't believe it. And even though, of course, we read the Bible, and of course, we study it, but in the back of our mind, it's kind of created this is an unintentional thing that we don't have confidence in the Bible, so we tend to put it aside or maybe think of it as allegory or, you know, it's good information, but. Right, And I'm not saying that individually we do that. I'm just saying that that's kind of one of those things that's built up about it. But where did the King James Bible come from? Okay, This came from the king in 1611, King James. Was he a good guy? <laughs> king James was a pedophile. Okay, he was a horrible guy. But why did he want the Bible published? Why did he do it? Because it was his way of controlling the message. Because... Just remember, 1611 is when this is published. This is only nine years before the pilgrims land in America. This era of this time is seeing the publication of the unauthorized versions of the Bible. And the pilgrims and the Puritans were being tortured and punished and imprisoned and all kinds of persecution because they were publishing the Bible without authorization. And so the way to control it was to publish it yourself, authorize a number of people, of scribes to come together and translate it according to what you want, in which there were two edicts given, number one, you have to make sure that there's nothing that's going to misalign with what the Church of England is preaching, and number two, if there's anything that suggests sedition or is going to cause these conflicts, have to be excised, those are out. So there's other things, but those are the two basic premises that's in the 1611 Bible, which means those plain and precious parts were taken out, and the Bible, as far as it was translated correctly, was a good warning, because there were some problems in that Bible that was published in 1611. It's the same Bible that we have today, this, the King James Bible. And so if we look at that Bible, chapter 1 in Genesis, the opening chapter, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Did you notice that it's in third-person narrative, as if it happened over there? Okay? It, that, that person or that deity over there, God, created the heavens and the earth. Okay? Well, here's the thing. It's two months after Joseph finishes publishing the Book of Mormon, 
organizes the church. It's now June of 1830, and he receives a revelation to translate the Bible. And he does. It takes about three and a half years, and he translates the Bible into what we have as the inspired version. But we don't have the inspired version. Okay? We don't actually have the inspired version unless we bought it from the Restoration Bookstore. And you have some footnotes, some KSTs, and there are some things in the appendix. You know how much of, of that is in, of the inspired version is in there? About 30%. About 30%. Now we have Moses. Moses covers the first six chapters of Genesis, but that's it. It stops. And it stops at a very important place that I think is kind of sad. Number one, in chapter 7 of the King James Version, there's only 25 verses in the King James Version of chapter 7 Genesis, which is the part about Enoch and the flood. In the inspired versions, there are 85 verses. 25 to 85. In fact, there's almost 200 verses in chapter 7, 8, and 9. They're not in the appendix. They're not in the footnotes. You don't even have access to them. And here's the big change, okay? Because if you read Moses chapter 1, that's the vision that, that Joseph sees Moses having. Moses is having this vision. He meets with God. He, no, he learns the nature of who God is. He learns the nature of man, and he learns the nature of Satan. But he also learns the reason that Utah Mormons are the biggest multi-level marketing group in, in the world. Okay? Tongue-in-cheek. The business that God has for all of us is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life in them, right? That is our family, multi-generational family business. How do you do it? Well, you tell two people. Most two people go out and tell two more people, so, right? So it's a multi-generational family business to, to literally save the souls of all of the children of God. But in Genesis chapter 2, it starts out, and it says, Moses, I'm going to tell you about this earth. Write what I said down. Write it down. Okay, this is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's in Moses chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, Moses, write it down. And then in Genesis 1, chapter, uh, verse 2, it says, I am the beginning. And in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Isn't that interesting? It puts the difference is now it's no longer in third person narrative. It is in first person narrative. It is the creator saying, this is my story. And it's a commandment for Moses to write it down. The last verse in Moses chapter 1, which is this vision, if you have the inspired version, it's actually in the preface. It's called a vision given to Joseph the seer. Well, the very last line or entry of the paragraph says, Moses, I'm going to tell you about this earth, and when I tell you, I want you to write it down. And then the very next verse, which is the first of Genesis, it says, Moses, I'm telling you about this earth, now write it down. So I'm, I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you. Now I'm telling you, write it down. This is my story. I want you to write this down. Okay, and as he writes it down, he actually says these things. That in the beginning, he says, I'm the one that created this. And the earth was about form, and he says, I caused darkness. See, the other one just says there was darkness. He says, I caused darkness to come upon the face of the deep. You ever thought about what that is and why that's important? If that one truth was there, the Christian world could have an idea of the pre-mortal life. But because it just says darkness is there, they assume it's just without light instead of God causing the darkness, which is what? This is the cleft or the cutting or the splitting of the spirit world. And a third of the hosts of heaven who rejected the plan are cast down to this earth. And they are the disembodied that, are, that plague us today. And they're part of this earth. They're the darkness. Okay, well, all darkness is is the absence mm -hmm. of light. They had an absence of light. And immediately after this, then, Christ says that, and I caused darkness. And then he says, let there be light. And there was light. So now you can see how these two things are very important understanding of light and darkness have to do with those that are coming to earth. Okay, now we're changing gears a little bit. If you heard me ask this question before, you don't get the answer. I don't know, maybe Elder Bartle might have brought this up too. But <laughs> who caused the first death on planet Earth? 
Who wants to draw a guess? Okay. Oh, let's say Katie. Okay. Okay. No. All right, so, so Katie's usually the first one next to you. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's the second one. Yeah. Almost always those are the first two arguments. Okay, I'm, I'm having some fun with you, really. Okay, but what it said right here that remember when Elohim says to Jehovah, make coats of skins to cover their nakedness. Where did he get the skins? Yes. Okay, the local candy store cool. right down the street, right? <laughs> That's right? There was no death and there were no skins. So the first death is the creator who created life taking the first life also. He has power over life and death. He actually is taking the first life. But what did he take that life with? What tools did he use? There were no tools of death. He had to make the tools out of the materials that he could show Adam how to do that. He made stone tools, arrow points, Spear points, knives, things, because he had to not just kill the animal. He had to skin the animal. And then he had to show Adam how to tan his hide. And why do we know that? Because remember, Adam was told to offer sacrifice, and how would he know how to do that unless somebody showed him how to do that? So he was shown how to offer sacrifice, and after many days, remember, watch this, watch this wisdom knowledge thing again. After many days, the angel says, why are you offering sacrifice? And what was Adam's answer? I know not, save I was commanded. So he, he, there's an interplay right here of knowledge and wisdom, and then the angel gives him the answer, the wisdom. It is after the similitude of the only begotten, which tells us what animal was being sacrificed. A lamb. So the first garment, the lamb skin. Now, here's the cool part about this all, okay? This is the first endowment of knowledge to man after they have fallen. And it's also the token, this endowment of knowledge, and it's a token of first death. And so when you think about what the garment represents, it is a token of the first death and the first endowment of knowledge on the earth after Adam and Eve have fallen. So... The, the, the idea of death coming into the world is a lot more than just kind of a random thing. This is the creator causing the death and in the process showing Adam how this happened. Now, death is a bloody thing. Sacrifice is a bloody thing, isn't it? And Adam would have to wash. He would have to wash himself in pure water to become clean from the blood <laughs> of his generation. When Joseph restored the gospel, he said the purpose of the priesthood was so that men could become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. That's the thing that men have to do, the priesthood responsibility. Now, we're told this when we are anointed, that we must become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. This is in Exodus. It's the story about what's going on about these things being cleansed from the blood and sins of this generation. Women are not told they have to become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Only the men are, because it's a priesthood responsibility. So, where did this first world happen where all this began? And how do we know? it? So, the first world was right here. Now, we know that Adam gathered his posterity right here. So, that pretty much gives us a an anchor point, right? And he's had all his posterity are with him. So they're right here. This proximity is their scientific proof of any of this thing. And this is where it gets kind of fun. Because this is a this is a fake piece, but it's gonna show you something interesting, okay? They're called Clovis points because they were first found in Clovis, New Mexico, not because the people before the flood were called Clovis. They're just called Clovis points because they were found in Clovis, New Mexico, and also a nearby Folsom, which they're sometimes called Folsom, so Clovis and Folsom points, okay? Now, these, these actually have a very special technology, if you can imagine, stone tools having technology, and it's this fluting right here, this fat fluting. It doesn't exist on any modern Native American artifacts. In other words, 
all the guys who lived around here and the Nephites and the Jaredites even, nobody knew how to make this flute. This wasn't discovered until the 1960s. And all the stone tools that have that fluting are really old. Now, modern anthropology says this. It's almost as if these things appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> In other words, there's no pre-Clovis points. I mean, sorry, there's no uh, across the Bering Strait where they thought everybody came from. There's none of these pre-Clovis points over there. There's no modulation of things over time as they kind of evolved that came and got better. These just appeared out of nowhere. And these pieces, every, you see that food, how defined that is, okay? These pieces are never made out of petrified wood. They're never made out of obsidian. They're only made out of chert or flint. And why is that important? You're going to know soon. Here's the, this is the chart that anthropology puts together. And you'll notice that the oldest are the Clovis points. They're the most sophisticated. And they lose that technology somewhere along the way. They don't understand that there is a major point where this changes. And so they just see this as an evolution. I'll pass that around. You can kind of feel that. Okay. They're always found under this black layer. That black layer is the flood layer. That's where the flood marks this place between above and below. Now, sometimes you can have there, they've discovered that there are sometimes um, new civilizations that were built on top of old ones. And so they're a little bit messed up. And then Rex the Wonder Woman, he does a number of things like burrows down and things change places a little bit. So there's some of that going on. But all of these people, when they're undisturbed, they're always found below this flood sediment. So before the, before the flood, when the earth was first created, on day three of creation, the waters are gathered together and the dry land appears. It's a single continent. We have no idea what that looked like. So what I've done is just put them together for you to see um, with the eventual countries, they didn't exist back then. And I have no idea if it looked like this, but we do know that South America and Africa and the United States actually do fit together. Okay, that's been scientifically established and even the fossils from continent to continent. So there is a strong correlation that these were all one continent. Now, you can see America up there. That's just so that you'll understand this next picture, which is where all the Clovis points are found. The concentration of all these Clovis points are not found in any other part of the world, but concentrated right here in the heartland. Each one of those black dots represents a location where they found Clovis points. It's kind of interesting that it's happening right in the general area of where Adam on Diamond is. No surprise there, right? Because Adam on Diamond, I hear that's not the sign anymore. We're going to go see him doing <laughs> tomorrow. Adam on Diamond is not just the only special place in this area, right? What else is real that's nearby that's extraordinarily special? Far west. Far west. Now, in a revelation given to Joseph, he says it's the most holy spot. We're not told why. We're not given the wisdom of why it's the most holy spot. But it is the most holy spot, according to... Doctrine and Covenants 115. I suppose that you can come up with your own ideas of why that's holy, but it's around where Adam is and he's worshiping. And I would suppose there'd be something incredible happening today, right? So remember the, the revelation that says that he gathers his plots, uh, Enoch gathers his, sorry, Adam gathers his posterity to include Enoch. Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to us in, in our time? Well, in the Enoch, it was 308 years old when Adam gathers his posterity, okay? Well, actually, he's 308 when he dies. He's 305 at the meeting. So he's 305 years old, a young, a young lad at the time, <laughs> only a third of the way through the normal 900-year lifespan. So in reality, if it was looking at us in our kind of comparative lifespan, <laughs> this is a 30-year-old man, 30-year-old guy. He's a third of the way through the normal and Adam and Methuselah book in the long lives and they both live over 900 years. So we know that these are long life people, right? So 30 or 300, yeah, it's about, if we were to compare how that would be, this is a young guy. And I suppose like a lot of younger than 30 people, maybe they're not on fire for the gospel. 
Not a bad guy, but he's maybe not on fire. But here's what happens, okay? For the next 60 years, Enoch is on fire. And he's preaching the gospel. And he becomes a force in the land. So great that he ends up offending everybody. Okay? All men were offended because of him. And they came to hear him because they said, there's a wild man in the land. So you can imagine something tripped his trigger. Something, you know, his father, Adam, calling him, telling him what this is all about. And he is on fire. And he spends the next 60 years until the city of Enoch is taken up. Okay, and so what happens is he sees the ark. 669 years in the future, it's a long ways off. He never meets Noah. And Noah's going to spend 600 years before the flood, right? And 100 of those years he'll be building the ark. But Enoch sees all of this, okay? He sees Noah and his family and the posterity of Noah. He sees them all and they're saved. And he's given this promise that it's through you. Your children are going to come through it. But he also sees this. He sees this terrible, terrible travesty that's happening. And he says, upon all the residue of the wicked, the flood swallowed him up. And he saw this, and he had bitterness of soul, and he wept. Who else? The gospel is always done as a way of repeating. So we see the message. Who else had the same experience? Nephi. When he saw his own posterity being extinguished. So he experienced this. This is, this is the, one of those patterns that's repeated in the gospel. Okay. Where did Noah build the ark? Here. Somewhere here in America, because this has all been gathered, and people are all right here. These things are happening. This is the heartland. This is the beginning. It's the promised land. It's where things start. Now, Joseph, this is a second-hand account. So this is not something that you can say, oh, it's absolute true. You know, Brother Barlow came here and said this. It's just an anecdotal story that he said that was being near South Carolina or somewhere. What I really find interesting, though, is that Ken Ham must have heard that story because he went and built a replica pretty close by in Kentucky, <laughs> which is near Cincinnati, Ohio, okay, not too far away from here. And he builds a full-size replica of the ark pretty close to where the ark would have been built by Noah. All right, so here's another trick question. I'm telling you a trick so when you, feel, you don't feel bad if you answer it wrong. <laughs> How many animals did Noah take on the ark? <laughs> okay, so far I've had three or four wrong answers and they're all the same. 32. <laughs> How about zero? Oh, because they came by themselves. That's right. That's the <laughs> straight It came to pass after seven days, and uh, the, the Lord actually says to Noah, get on, and the animals are going to come to Noah, okay? So I'm going to come back with slide. Let's go here first. Genesis 8, 38, they went into Noah. They went into Noah, into the ark. Two and two of all flesh were in is the breath of life. It's important to know that, that you know, as you study what the difference between the breath of life versus the life of, say, plants or bacteria or some other thing. But the animals were told. Now, there's an apocryphal book called the Book of Jasher. You ever heard of that? Yeah. The Book of Jasher has some really cool stuff in it. And one of those things that the Lord says is not all the animals are going to get there, and you're going to know which ones can get on because they're going to come and bow. The animals will bow before you, okay? And, you know, if you can imagine these animals of all types bowing before Noah. In the book of Joshua, there's a story where a lioness and two whelps come, and all three of them bow before Noah. So he's going to allow them on, but the two whelps turn and chase their mother off and don't let her on, only the two babies. Now, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because if you read what we hear, I skip this one, come back to it. The flood was on the earth in the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month and the 17th day of the month. 17th day of the second month. That's not February because the calendar we have today is this calendar based on Pope Gregory or the Gregorian calendar, which was also based on Julius Caesar, the Julian calendar. 
And that's kind of a twist up of the whole thing. That's not the calendar that Adam used. It's not the calendar that Enoch used. That calendar would have been based on the equinoxes. When did Moroni visit Joseph Smith? September. September 22nd on the fall equinox. These things happened in the opening of the earth and the spring equinox. Joseph Smith had things happen in the fall equinox. And the equinox is an interesting time. It's because when light and darkness are exactly equal, mm -hmm. things are in balance, okay? So the 17th day of the second month would have put us around mid-May. And during mid-May, what's going on? These are baby times, right? So if we just let's skip ahead to this, and let's get to this part right here. Now, how many of you can imagine an 8,000 mile across orb, if I were to just say, just imagine that in your mind. Can you imagine 8,000 miles? That's pretty tough, right? The Earth, the crust of the Earth, is 125,000 feet, feet average. Can you imagine 125,000 feet thickness? Probably not. So let's make it more able to imagine, and we'll shrink it to a basketball. Now you can imagine a basketball. Well, our crust that was 125,000 feet thick is now as thick as a single sheet of paper on our basketball-sized Earth. Okay, that's it. Now the Earth is spinning, and as it's, it's going around the sun, but it's also spinning. And the spinning is a force that keeps things in balance. There's a gravitational force going down, and there's a centrifugal force pushing out. You've seen that when you swing a bucket of water over your head, right? The water doesn't fall out because the centrifugal force is keeping the water at the bottom of the bucket. Well, that centrifugal force is pushing the continental plates out, and gravity is trying to pull it down. So they're in a perfect balance, okay? Something happens that perturbs that radial spin rate. Something happens in the universal model. We propose that it's a comet. There are long period comets that would establish this, maybe about the size of the moon. It doesn't hit the Earth. It doesn't collide with the Earth. It just perturbs the spin a tiny fraction, like we go 1%, a tiny amount. And what happens is the spin rate slows a little bit and Gravity doesn't change, but centrifugal force does, and as it does, the plates begin to sink. Now, in the scriptures, it says, the fountains of the great deep burst, and the windows of heaven opened, and then rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So we often think of the rain as the cause of the flood, but the rain doesn't come until after the continents have broken, until the fountains of the great deep burst, and all of this explosive material is coming out. Now, water, when it's heated, changes 1,700 times in volume from liquid to steam when it makes that change. How many of you have pressure cooked here? Okay, the pressure cooking changes that you put about between 10 and 15 PSI, and that's it, right? What happens if you turn that up to 100 PSI? What would happen? <laughs> There'd be an explosion, and it would probably blow up the kitchen. We know it's the danger of that high pressure, right? So this is a, a, this high pressure thing is a kind of a big deal here. Well, as that's happening, as these crusts are sinking and water is getting deeper, it's creating higher and higher pressures, and the water can get hotter and hotter without exploding in the steam. So we end up getting to this point right here where the water is deeper and deeper until it's 30,000 feet deep. I remember our thin, our, our paper thin crust, our paper thin crust, 125,000 feet. So when the crust sinks during the flood, it only sinks a third of the thickness of that piece of paper. So on our, on our huge earth, for the crust to sink when the fountains of the great deep burst, it only sinks such a small amount that it would be imperceptible if you were standing on the moon watching this event happen. You wouldn't even see it. But that sinks 30,000 feet. Why is that important? Because when things rub together, they create friction. Friction creates heat. So when that ha happens, when whole plates are sliding together, now you only have to move 10,000 feet of rock, one millimeter to create enough heat to melt that rock. One millimeter. These crusts are sinking 30,000 feet. Now, the biggest experience we've ever had is in 2004 in December. The Sumatra earthquake was more than nine point on the Richter scale. That was a 30 foot movement under the ocean. 30 feet. This is 30,000. 
So this massive amount would have thrown so much material and so much water. See, science dismisses the flood because they think there's no way to account for it. It's impossible to have 40 days of continuous rain. And even if it did rain in 40 days, that's only going to put a few inches on the whole surface of the earth. But there's no way to account for that unless, the, unless that water comes from the fountains of the deep. And as it's exploding and blowing stuff up into the air, okay, now let me change your perception, because right now you're thinking of that steam coming off the pasta bowl, right? How much lava came out of Mount St. Helens in 1980 when it erupted? Nothing. No lava came out of Mount St. Helens. It was only steam and all that debris that came out. The ash, the gas, <laughs> the dust, 98% water, 80,000 feet in the air over a few days. That's one, and it's a small one. Imagine 10,000 of those simultaneous. The largest, the loudest sound ever witnessed on Earth was Krakatoa when it exploded. And that sound went around the Earth twice. One volcano, imagine a thousand. What do you think was happening to the people outside the ark when they heard that? One? Yes. The fear. They had never experienced thunderstorms and rain like that. And this was louder than they could have ever, than you and I can even, even imagine. It was loud, but inside the ark, that would have been terrifying too, because for 40 days, while this rain is happening, the ark is completely sealed. It says the animals are tossed about like pottage. Imagine the faith that Noah and his sons would have had to have during that 40-day ordeal of darkness and tremendous seas and sound. Terrifying. Terrifying to get through that. So here's kind of a brief time limit. So beginning early May, it rains for 40 days, but the fountains of the deep, they continue to flow for 150 days. And you might have read in there, it says the water was abated after 150 days. But what does abated mean? Abated just means stop. It didn't say goes away, it just stopped after 150 days. That's half a year, right? With the 17th day of the seventh month, and remember it's, uh, you know, it's of the second month, so now we're five months into it, right? The ark runs aground, but they can't see the mountains yet. That doesn't happen for two more months before they finally see the tops of the mountains. And then after that, it goes on. Forty days later, the raven and the dove have no place to land. Now, here's another part in the Bible that's important to understand. What did the raven and dove represent? Death and life. The black and the white. Darkness and light. In the beginning, God creates a call of darkness, and then he says, let there be light. Death is still on the earth. Death came into the garden. Death is still on the earth. The earth is cursed for Adam's sake. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> life comes. The bird that represents life is the dove. The earth is actually freed from its curse after the flood so that she can put forth her abundance. And it's now in preparation for the time that will begin to lead toward the atonement. So death precedes life. Okay, so first day of the first month. That's an interesting day. That's when the ark is open. It's too wet to walk out, but it's the first day of the first month, which is correlated exactly with the first day that Adam leaves the Garden of Eden. So this is the opening of the earth the second time around. Everything that we read about the scriptures is, a, is a, a reference to another time, back and forth. Everything is, is correlated back and forth. You know, and as you begin to understand this, the book of Genesis, especially the restored, what Joseph restored, becomes, I think, one of the most important books to understand in the scriptures. First 11 chapters are the salvation chapters. Okay, so two months later, that, that finally dry enough to venture out. It's now July, more than a year later. That's when they finally get to leave. And then 150 years later, in the days of Philae, they're still moving. They're actually still moving today. A lot of the things we have happening today are the earth coming back into equilibrium. We want to talk about what that means to, for example, the island of Hawaii. I'll, I'll talk to you after about that. But everything's coming back into alignment. All right, the next biggest question that I always get asked 
And everybody wants to know what about <laughs> the dinosaurs, right? And so a lot of us kind of grew up with this idea that the dinosaurs came from another planet that was taken apart and made into this earth because we can't account for how these big beasts could possibly live with Adam, and we can't account for 65 million years of age. And so we've said, oh, that must be the answer. But how many of you guys live with uh, lions and tigers and bears? Uh -huh. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. What would that be? <laughs> we don't, but they live on the earth with us. It's just they live in a different place. And there's no doubt, because if you read the story of Genesis chapter 1, it's a spiritual creation. And then in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is naming all the animals, all of them. He didn't name them dinosaurs, though. Dinosaurs is a modern invention that makes us kind of not remember who they really were. So the truth is, probably this is the best explanation that happened to the dinosaurs. <laughs> they actually were not on the ark, except for those that were, and some were. Some were definitely on the ark, because in the record, there are a number of dinosaurs that are included, like in, at the uh, temple at Anger Wat. There's these images of dinosaurs carved in the motif in the stone that would have been there afterwards. Now, in the Bible, they're not called dinosaurs. They're referred to as dragons and leviathan. Okay? These things are there. Mm -hmm. And here's the other part. This is the scientific backing of all this stuff. Every single major dinosaur uh, quarry in the whole world is always found in flood sediment. Now, they always come up with this. Well, like in, in, a, in a, a Alaska, they must have died when they were crossing the flood, right? Um, that just a flash flood happened to wipe those guys out. But in Patagonia, which is clear down in South, uh, uh, South America, these guys were smothered by a flood. <laughs> so you're half a world away, got way up in Arctic Alaska and all the way down to the south. But then if you go to Argentina, they were perished in the flood, and then Zingong, China, those guys died probably from flooding. In Illinois, that's nearby, right? They died in death by a catastrophic flood. And then in Alberta, Canada, they were trying to cross a river in the flood, and they got flooded. Now, John, there's just one, because where these centrists are found, there's a thousand animals. And they were all balled up and shoved into a ravine and disarticulated, meaning in pieces. And the, the force was so powerful. Now, these centaurs aren't really huge dinosaurs, but they have a pretty big femur bone, and they found a femur bone sheared lengthways. So the force of this little flood was so powerful that it took a thousand animals and scooped them up and sheared one of their bones lengthwise. Timing is everything. The most common fossil found in the record, the most common dinosaur fossil, are dinosaur eggs. And it turns out, in the process of the writing the universal model, this little piece of amber has fish eggs and frog eggs, and the fish eggs are still liquid inside. And this is an amber that's supposed to be millions of years old. <clears throat> petrified pine cones are always petrified with them closed, in a closed position. They're not open. What time do cones happen? In the spring. So all of these things are evidences of things that happened in the spring. Okay, and this is covered in our book, The Universal Model. That's, I have that over there. You can look at it. Volume one is kind of the whole process of how the Earth is formed, the science behind a, a water planet, and the questions about why the Earth. And these are questions that are in modern science they can't answer. For example, how sand is formed or many other things, okay? Now, just so you know, one of the little add-on piece here. Mm -hmm. I've got goose. <laughs> That's okay. So how, how long has the idea of a hot molten earth been around? Does anybody know? The, you know, you open your textbooks and it's got a earth and it's got a molten core and nickel iron interior and we're told that's pretty much settled science right they've been there and seen that yeah. nobody's been there <clears throat> this comes about because of a book that was published by charles lyell he's a british geologist and he published principles of geology and that's when the whole scientific world accepts the earth that is incalculably old and hot in its core in a book published january of 1830 
How's that for an interesting correlation? Mm -hmm. So you have that published six months before Joseph gets a revelation about how the earth is actually created that's in water. We have these two opposing ideas that come in the same year. Okay, so in addition to the universal model of books, my wife and I developed this curriculum that would go along with it, okay? And this is, for example, the page in the beginning of the geography book. So geography is important because it's where people live, and it's about what they did and how they moved around the earth. Where should we start geography then? We should start right here. And this is what our children need to be taught about where things are. And I'll, I'll get back to that in just a minute. And so they need to know the science behind it. So that's why we've got the closest points. And we talk about the Garden of Eden. And we talk about knowledge versus wisdom. And then we also talk about where people move. Now, the modern science version says we all came out of Africa. And we came across the Bering Strait. Scripturally, that's not true. Where did everybody come from first? Yeah. Here. Here. And then we got carried across the waters. And, and then how did we get back? Across the waters. Mm -hmm. Okay, now think of this for a minute. How did we get here on the planet Earth? How did you get here? Water. You crossed the waters of birth. Mm -hmm. You came by water and by blood. How do you get back? You have to cross the waters of baptism. Noah crossed the waters to the other side. The brother Jared and Nephi and the pilgrims and all the others came and crossed the waters to get back to the promised land. Where are we going? To the promised land. How do we get there? We have to be born again by water and by blood. The blood of Christ and the waters of baptism. You see this correlation, everything's a message of what's really happening. Crossing the waters is, is a pretty important thing. Now, when we get down, I'll share a couple of other interesting things that, that you can see in there. Okay, so now, new subject. Now, I know I'm covering pieces here, because there's no way that I can cover an 800-page book in an hour. There's no way that I can cover everything in the Bible and the science book and all that together. So I'm giving you these pieces, and then we can open it up and have some discussion for however long you want to be here, okay? But we're going to take one little thread, and we're going to talk about the connection between sandstone, petrified wood, and dinosaur bones. This one connection that makes everything all of a sudden make some really cool sense, okay? So the first thing we're gonna talk about is sand that makes sandstone. What does modern science say makes sandstone? They say that a mountain millions of years ago, the Appalachians ground down and eroded and blew across the continent and landed on the Colorado Plateau to make sandstone. And it was pressurized after millions of years and turned into sandstone. That's the story of how all sandstone forms. But if we actually look at this sand up close, what color is that sand? Brown, right? Mm -hmm. But if we look at sandstone under microscope, hey, okay, there's some of that brown sand that you saw blowing, and then there's coral pink sand dunes if you've ever been there. That's red. But this is what it looks like under microscope. See right here? It's clear. These are clear, except on the outside, they're stained red, but the crystal, the grains themselves are clear. Have you ever climbed a clear mountain before? <laughs> and why is it that there's only clear? These one or two pieces here are iron. That's another part of the story, because this quartz crystal is, by weight, it's about 2.5 grams per cubic centimeter, and the iron is five, twice as heavy. How did iron blow across at the same time the quartz did? And where's the rest of the stuff? Where's the rest of the rocks? Where's the rest of the debris in the sandstone? Okay? And once you start to ask these questions, then you begin to ask questions like, well, how did the Grand Canyon actually form? That's part of our tour that we do. And we go through every year. Um, it's the mo one of the coolest times is in the morning. Our second day is we get up long before the sun, and we watch it. And we watch it kind of break down layer by layer by layer what all those are. Okay, and the very top layer is Kaibab limestone. The next layer is Toro Week sandstone. The limestone, sandstone, limestone, sandstone. That's what's happening all the way down. This is sort of shale. And the question is, is for modern science, the only way that can happen is that seas must have come in, laid down some limestone, and the seas had to go out so the wind could blow things across 
put some sand down, and then had to sink down. Seas had to come back in, compress it, turn it into a rock, lay some more limes from down, raise back up, sand had to blow in. So this is up and down, up and down seven times before the canyon formed. That's the only way they can account for it. In the Coconino layer, which is the third layer down, fourth layer down, um, the sandstone is actually laid, look, they look like uh, sand dunes, except that when in air, sand dunes are steeper because the wind blows them up the sand dune face and then the sand falls off and it creates this kind of a, a sand dune shape, right? And these angles are pretty commonly the same in sand dunes. It's called the angle of repose, which is how much sand before it starts to slide down. It creates these angles up and then an angle down. Well, in water, it's like this. It's considerably less, about quite a bit less. And so when you look at the Coconino sandstone layer, you can see that. And they say, oh, no, that's, that's a petrified sand dune. No possible way that could be in air. It had to be underwater. But they reject it because they have no answer for how that is. And so that's, that's part of understanding how sandstone is made. We've made sandstone, so part of our experimental stuff is not just theory. We've actually made sandstone. And we know the process. In order to make sandstone, you have to start with the grains. Now, what are the grains made of? 70% of all sand? Silicon. It's quartz. Silicon dioxide, SiO2. And these are quartz crystals. So in order to really, truly understand sandstone, we have to understand the sand crystals. And to do that, we have to understand quartz. And it so happens we've made quartz. So right here, for example, this is before this quartz was grown. It's about the size of a, a bean. 24 hours later, double in size. Okay, so we know how to grow quartz as easily as you know how to make an ice cube, which is crystalline water. But it takes 13,000 PSI. And it takes water temperatures that are 350 degrees Celsius, which is about 700 Fahrenheit. And it takes a mineralizer, silica. Remember that, that pressure that was created when the flood happened? 30,000 feet creates 13,000 PSI. Friction creates super hot water. And those together with the material that's blown out, the silica, give us everything perfect to be able to create quartz crystals and also to petrify dinosaur bones. And that's what it looks like on the inside of a bone. Where this right here, these are actually, you know, it's just like your bone is full of holes. And, you know, and so the stuff is stripped out of those bones. What's left is a scaffolding and the crystallization occurs in those holes, that precipitation of silica. Okay, it's a little easier to understand with petrified wood, which is more common than dinosaur bones. Petrified wood is found everywhere in every state, every nation, and every continent in the world. Petrified wood is the most plentiful fossil. And we've made that too. We've made petrified wood. So here is a crystal, run number 58. Okay, this is wood and crystal before. So you, this, this is a seed. So we're, we know how to grow that. So that's kind of the, the test to see if it's growing. And then we noticed that you had to, the wood had to be stripped of its lichen, of its living essence, and be soaked and stripped of that. If it wasn't soaked, then it would just destroy it. So it had to be had it soaked in water for a few hours or a day or two to be stripped of this lignin, okay, this living essence. And then it had this kind of hollow, and then we put it in our autoclave. By the way, that's just only three quarters of an inch. We, we couldn't, you know, 13,000 BSI, that's a lot. So this is a pipe to, this is before the insulation, the protection of the rounder, just to show you what it is. That's a steel pipe that's welded to this bottom plate. And then the whole thing has six inches of, of stuff. So if anything happens, it blows up. And the pressure is not the full tube. The pressure, the 2,000 or the uh, 13,000 PSI is actually just the top area of this. So it's not like a whole you know, cannon ready to blow up. But that's what happens. And then this is a geode that also grew in run number 55. We grew geodes accidentally, but then all of a sudden, everything started to make sense. Geodes, quartz crystals, petrified wood right here. First time, February of 2005. I'm an engineer. I read an article not too long ago how to make fossils in about a week. 
Yep, and that's a different one. That's those are impression fossils rather than petrification. That's a, I, I don't know if I've read the same article, but I've read a recent article about that. And and uh, afterwards, I'll talk to you about that if you want, because there's a little bit different in how these are made. Petrification is the changing of the carbon material into silica or into a silica rock. So um, a close up of that, and here's this is a lab made piece of petrified wood up close compared to a log that's in petrified forest. You see how it's hollow? Well, this wasn't hollow when it started. It ended up blowing out the center part. And only this outside edge is now the rock, the silicified piece of rock. This is what you see if you go to petrified forest. All these pieces of petrified forest everywhere. Now, I believe there's a special reason for this particular kind of rock. And if we look back here, Genesis 9, this is God spoke to Noah. Now, think of this. God, or this is Jehovah, he's actually maybe sitting around the campfire because it's Noah and his sons. They're all seeing Christ come. And he says, I'm going to renew the covenant that I made with your father, Enoch. Noah never met his father, Enoch. Enoch never knew Noah in at least in this life. Noah is on the city of Enoch somewhere. But here is God sitting there saying, I'm going to renew the covenant. I'm going to establish it by maybe your father Enoch concerning your seed after you. And what he says is, the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the covenant. Okay, so he's telling him, I'm going to remember. Now, we've always thought of the rainbow as just being a promise not to flood the earth, right? But this is the covenant. Okay, when men should keep my commandments, Zion will come again on the earth, the city of Eden, which I've caught up to myself. And this is my everlasting covenant, that when my posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then Zion shall look downward, and the heavens shall shake, shake with gladness, and the earth will tremble with joy. In the latter days, in the book of Revelation, it says that the earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunken man. So there's got to be a proximity thing here. Depending on where you stand, it's either going to reel to and fro like a drunken man, or it's going to tremble with joy. How many want to be in that place? <laughs> okay. Now, when Adam comes to bless his posterity, do you think they're going to be terrified of the tossing him to and fro of the earth like a drunken man, or is the earth going to be trembling with joy? And this city of Zion is going to be coming down and eating, and all this is going to be happening, right? This is this is all part of the covenant. You notice it says the bow is the token of the covenant, the same thing about water not flooding the earth, even though that does say that later, this is a special thing to know. It's about the covenant that has to do with us in our life as we prepare for the return of the Savior. And how, why does this kind of fit together with petrified wood? Because petrified wood doesn't do really anything other than look pretty. Now, the flood itself is the most creative event that ever happened on the earth next to the creation itself. During the flood is when all the coal was created, and all the oil, and the salt, and the lust. Lust is the type of sediment that actually is the, it underlies all of the most prolific bread baskets in America, including right here, up into Canada, into Brazil, into China. The less hills. What's that? The less hills, even the less hills up in... The lust. Uh, yeah, they call lust, they call less hills. Lust or lust, less, yeah. Yeah, they call, if you go from yep. I-29 up into... See, that's that's a really strange kind of sediment that modern science thinks is the product of a glacial till because they can't explain how it got here. And it's a mix of calcium carbonate and silica. And those two things aren't supposed to be together because acid will dissolve the calcium carbonate. Sodium hydroxide will dissolve the silica. Those two being together prove that it's a living process. It's a living essence. That, that lust or lois, however you pronounce it, it's the sediment that is the most abundant at providing life. It is a living soil that is produced during flood. Now, if you think of this covenant, you remember Moses is the one who receives the whole story of the creation, right? And then he gets to live through part of that, some of the stuff that we just take for granted. So, for example, before they leave, Moses shows up to Pharaoh, and what's the first thing he does? What's the first magic or miracle that he shows? He throws the staff down. And what does it become? 
A serpent. A serpent. What is in the Garden of Eden? The serpent. the serpent. And immediately after the Garden of Eden, after the serpent comes in and Eve partakes of the fruit, what happens? Death comes into the world. What is the first woe that Moses pronounces on Egypt? Turn the water to blood. See this patterning is over and over again. What's the last thing? The death, the death by killing the lamb, painting the blood of the lamb on the post. Just like Adam had to do, right? These things are just these repeated stories to sell over and over again. The story's the same. Now Moses goes and takes the people of Israel out into the wilderness, and he's wandering, and he all of a sudden comes up to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh says, oh, they've entangled themselves, they've backed themselves into a corner. Moses gets to actually relive a moment of the creation where he says, the waters would gather together, and the dry land appeared. And they walked across, they crossed the waters on dry ground. You see the crossing of the waters is still also a thing, isn't it? Forty years later, Moses is not able to go into the promised land. By the way, do you know why? There are two times in the Bible where Moses, the first time the people of Israel are, are thirsty, and he, he's told, the Lord says, meet me at the rock of Horeb, strike the rock, I'm going to meet you there, and water will come in. The second time is about three years later, and they're in Kadesh, which is near Jordan, and he, the Lord says to Moses, go speak to the rock before Israel, and the water will come out. Speak it. But Moses gets frustrated. And he says, must we do everything for you in his frustration? He strikes them twice. And so he's not able to show the power of the word. And God says, because of that, you will not be able to go into the promised land. And so Joshua is now head of the hosts of Israel. And it's a flood stage. And they come up to the Jordan, and God says, have those that bear the ark walk in up to their ankles. And what happens? All of a sudden it says the water became as a wall and backed up to the city of Adam. Another fun correlation. It backs up all the way up here. And they cross dry shot. They come across. So it's like here's the big miracle, creation. Here's a little bit smaller one, the flood. Here's another smaller one, I'm sorry, uh, Moses crossing that. Here's a smaller one, Joshua. It continues. There's another smaller one where Elijah and Elisha, they're on their way back, and Elijah strikes the river, and it opens up, and he walks across, and then Elisha sees him get taken up in the chariot, right? And, and on the way back, he decides to pick up the mantle, and He's a little frustrated that all this happened. Like, what am I supposed to do? And, and he walks back and he says, well, he strikes the river and he parts and he walks across it again. But each one is like this bigger, smaller, smaller, smaller to show the same pattern to get us to where we are today, to be prepared, to be ready. Now back to Petrified Wood. When Joshua crosses the Jordan River, he then tells, the Lord tells him to tell each of the leaders of the tribe to go get a rock and to build this stone monument. And he says, I want you to do this, and I want you to have your, for your generations, take your children back to this and show them so that they can, they can remember the covenant. Remember the covenant. <clears throat> and remember the covenant that God made with Enoch. The token of the covenant is the rainbow. But have you ever tried to catch a rainbow? You can't. The petrified wood has all the colors of the rainbow in it. And the only time petrified wood was ever formed on the earth was during the flood. That's it. One time. During the time that Noah was aboard the ark. Now this is a painting somebody did of petrified wood. Notice they've got all the colors of the rainbow in there. Because... I believe that the petrified wood is a way of taking this token of the bow and sharing it with your kids and saying, remember the covenant. Remember the covenant God made with Enoch, that he made with Noah, that he made with Moses, that he made with Joshua, that he made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way down to the covenant God made with 
Joseph Smith, the temple will be built. Adam, or the ancient of days, will come to Adam on Diom and remember the covenant. And, and hold on to that and show them and remember that. And I cover a lot of this in my book, Water. It's, it's over here afterwards. I want you to I mean, go pass a couple up so you can kind of flip through that. It's a little book. I wrote this to guys because guys read pictures and they want to know footnotes so they know where the, you know, there's any truth to it. So it's got footnotes and pictures. And it's small. It's written because, you know what, we don't take time to read big books anymore until it's, I wanted to write it and, and let you look at it. And there's a lot of what I talked about in here. There's a few things more, and then there's other stuff too. Most importantly, though, if I can leave you with this, if you don't have a copy of the inspired version, get a copy. We actually worked with the Restoration Bookstore. I helped them reprint it so we could make that available. So I have those. If you feel you can go get them there, it's fine. And we also just published the five books of Moses, which are the first five books of the Pentateuch which are the story of Genesis and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And that one's done based on the Joseph Smith translation also. It's in, it has red letters where Christ speaks, and then it's bracketed where Joseph added it. But the, the inspired version is just, it's a copy of the 1867. There's no commentary. It's just pure 1867 Bible that you can read. So I want to leave you with this testimony, okay, that I know that the gospel of Jesus Christ, I know that Christ lives, and I know that he is the author of the creation and all of these things, and they're all done for our good and our edification, and that we have an opportunity to do something profound and remarkable, because as members of the church, we have been given, we've been commissioned to do this one thing, and that is to open the doors of crossing the waters of baptism back to the spirit world <coughs> more than many other people. There's eight billion people in the book today, and you have been inducted into this one thing to bring to pass the immortality and the eternal life of man. Going to the temple and doing that work is the single most important thing we need to do to bring to pass that point where Zion can come again. We must become united, turn our hearts to heaven, keep God's commandments, and, and get this work done. But I have a testimony in these things, and, and I'll be glad to talk to you about that afterwards if you like. And if I can, bear this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.